Hello and welcome to today's RegCast. I am your host, Lucy Sheriff. Today, we are going to be getting sassy. And I am not, in this instance, talking about chatting back to your boss, although, of course, if you feel the need, do. Uh, I'm talking about software as a service, SaaS, um, and mo more specifically, is it going to make you more efficient? So uh, today, to help me answer these burning questions, we have a, a panel of charming experts. Um, we have, uh, let's crack right on and introduce you. We have Jeff from Dorma UK, who is knee deep in a migration to software as a service as we speak. Hi, Jeff. Welcome aboard. Hi. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about uh, what you do at Dorma UK. Um, I am the infrastructure and service desk manager for Dorma UK in Ireland, um, and we service our users. Fantastic. So uh, you're the one that everyone gets cross with when it doesn't work. This is my responsibility. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and as ever, we have the charming and delightful Dale Vile <laughs> here with us from Freeform Dynamics. Thank you, Lucy. Um, <laughs> anytime. And he knows what you guys know because you tell him. Um, and, of course, the third expert on the panel today is uh, the most important one. That's you guys. So don't forget to send your questions in. Above my head, you'll see the buttons that you need to press for feedback. Don't do that until the end. Questions, do that now. Um, and uh, any other things that you want to tell us about how it's all going. So uh, don't be shy. Get involved. So uh, now that we've done all the introductions, let's crack right on. Uh, Dale, software as a service is not the newest topic how about you tell us, is, why is this still an important issue for our readers? Um, well, software as a service is obviously being talked about quite a bit as uh, part of the whole cloud discussion that's going on across the industry at the moment. Some, uh, some people are arguably quite obsessed with it. Um, <laughs> but actually, there, there is uh, a, a lot of goodness in this whole space. And if, if you kind of get under the skin of um, a lot of the hype that, that's, that's out there, uh, and talk about specifics, as we, we are going to be doing today, yeah. uh, then there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, we've done some good um, uh, webcasts previously on some of the more adventurous aspects of software yeah. as a service, high-performance computing and highly distributed consumer-facing applications, this kind of stuff. Today, we're, we're kind of in the mainstream, uh, how, how do you serve the needs of uh, your, your business users in the office, in the field? So this is kind of everyday computing kind of problems yeah. we're talking about. So it's arguably a little bit sort of um, the boring end, but uh, actually it's the end that yeah. you know, we're all paid to, to, to do. So, fulfill. Jeff, at the less glamorous end, is it all working? Um, <laughs> in, in today's environment, uh, the, the SaaS that we've currently got up and running is taking our business forward. Um, we've, we've identified a couple of products that are out there that seem to suit our business yeah. needs. Um, so, so, in short, our first tentative step into, into this wheel, yeah. yes, it seems to be working for Fantastic. us. Fantastic. So I think it probably would be sensible at this point if you could just give us a little bit of background <coughs> about Dorma UK and what you guys do as a company, as a business. OK. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are, we've got 250 desktop users, a uh, mixture between actual physical desktops and laptops with inside uh, Dorma UK in Ireland. Um, as I said before, we, we, I run the service desk uh, for these guys. Um, our market is automatic doors, uh, door furniture, and we also have a service division as well, which goes around and maintains our doors, our installations, but also our competitors as well. And is that, is that your office? That is our <laughs> office. It's a very nice building too. <laughs> Where so is that? Jeff? That is in North Hertfordshire in Hitchin. So what is what is what is the tech function within Dorma UK? What are you guys <coughs> needing to do to support your? Because I mean, you're, you've got you've got installers, you've got engineers. Yeah, what, we've, what we've got the IT we've got a, a distributed sales force throughout the UK as well, um, and we've also got a distributed engineering workforce as well. So it's one man in a van. He's got tools, he's got equipment. We've got shipping. He has a, a PDA that his work is distrib distributed to him via. Um, all of this technology, we have to maintain, keep our engineers up and running, keep them involved, make sure that the next job is being delivered to them, they know where they need to be, they know where they need to go, what parts they can expect to use on, next, on their next job. Uh, the sales team is, is exactly that. They need to be in touch yeah. with their customer base uh, uh, as much as they possibly yeah. can be as well. So those are the day-to-day -day functionalities of, of what we try and do is to, is to keep that keep everybody in to contact. To keep the man in his van exactly. in on the, the right move, place. On, on, yeah. In the move with and the customers right with the, the right doors place. that open yeah. nicely. Exactly, yeah. 
And, and I mean, obviously, you guys, the, as well as that, you have the function you need to support the business side yes, of things. Yes, we, we, we've, got, we've got our own ERP systems that, that, that these all feed into. So, you know, we've, yeah. we've got our, our normal IT environment yeah. with desktops, office installations, normal problems, can't open files, missing <laughs> emails. They, yeah, the run of the mill service desk tasks yeah. that we have to do. So, yeah. So then. What, what's the problem with the kit that you have? Why are you migrating? What was the what was the driver um, behind our, our, We recognise that the kit that we've got installed at the moment, we're running Exchange 2003 in the environment. Yeah. Um, our, our office suite is anything from 2003, 2007, and 2010. So, so yeah. it's not standardised nice on anyone. <laughs> yeah, it's not standardised on, on anything at all. Um, and the hardware that the Exchange is running on is now becoming end of life I mean, it, it's highlighted as a risk yeah. you know, we, we've got a database that has grown and grown over the years the volume of email that's going through uh, today is, is completely different to the traffic that we used to have yeah. five years ago um, and we recognise that this is, is a risk to the business yeah. you know, the, the, the email when it first came out a long time ago hmm. Great, everybody was talking to their friends today. It's a critical business application yeah. that, that, that we need to deliver. So, so it's, not, it's not if it's going to fall over no. and leave you in a big hole, it's, it's when. It's when, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, that was, that was our main driving force yeah. is, is we, we have recognised where the problem is and, and now we need to try and find a solution to, to resolve that. So. Yeah. So then the next question is how did you, how do you move on from there? You need, you need a new system. You went to a consultant. You talked to someone else. We, we went SAS? to we, we not, went to an external an partner. Yeah. yeah, we went to an external partner and and we presented them with our current environment um, and said, we know we need to do something. Um, initially, we were going to keep it in house and we were going to do uh, an upgrade on the hardware and the software and the licenses that were involved mm. in that as well. And and it was actually uh, Form Solutions, Form IT Solutions that, that recommended. I think maybe you need to look at yeah. Office 365 from Microsoft as yeah. an alternative to what you're trying to do in house. So. Dale, is this the kind of thing? Do you do you see a lot of this when you talk to the readers? Is this is this the kind of thing? Yeah, you guys as, are there as, experiencing? as Jeff was, was talking, obviously your business in terms of what you do and deliver out to your customers is um, uh, is, is pretty unique. But when you look at the shape of your business, you've got field <coughs> sales guys, you've got um, field service guys, you've got. Uh, uh, the, the usual mix of, of kind of office-based yeah. staff, uh, an element of distribution in your business. I mean, this is pretty typical of, yeah. of, of a lot of what we, we find, and most people listening will probably be in an environment that has at least some elements that are similar to that. Um, the, the other thing is, you, you, you know, you've got your own on-premise uh, capability, same as if that's not going away. Again, that's, that's kind of what we hear from yeah. most people out there. It's not as if everyone is looking at cloud as a total replacement for what they do. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's from working in to, to, to deal with specific problems in, in the IT delivery yeah. mix. So, yeah, very, very um, typical story. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, there was, there was another driver for your, for your change, wasn't there? The company, it wasn't just about, once you, <coughs> once you started this process, it wasn't just that the company needed a new kit and you did, needed to think about a new way of doing it. You were actually having a fairly substantial restructuring we, of how the, the internals of everything was working. Yeah, the, compa the company um, it, it has a worldwide presence. Our, we've got our head offices in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got presence throughout the world. Um, but we've been reorganised in the last year. We used to be a region on our own. It used to just be yeah. UK and Ireland. And, and those, all the employees with inside there were our responsibility. We've now become part of a larger area where we've now got 26 countries that are all <laughs> part of the same area. Um, That's a lot of bucks stopping with you all of a sudden. There's, 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 it's distributed still across. We, we do have IT capability yeah. in, in each of the locations or, or where the, uh, the, the concentration of users um, mm -hmm. tends to be with inside there. But we very quickly were asked to provide solutions for how can we collaborate across 26 countries, all on different systems, all using different technology. And, and while we were looking at Office 365, we, we sort of leapt upon the SharePoint solution that actually yeah. was part of the offering that, that comes from Microsoft. And that's the element that we've got up and running. Our finance department are currently using it today to make sure that, that the policies for, for our finance department are in one central place and that yeah. everybody is aware of, of, of what is required from the business point of view. So, so that was a very, very quick win for us. Yeah. So you've got 
you're looking at how how SaaS is actually working for you guys to make you more efficient. You've got this. I find I, I think it's quite interesting because a lot of cloud stuff seems to be very much about working from home, getting the Office 365. The fact that you guys have actually gone on the SharePoint initially is a little bit of a different approach. It was, it was uh, yeah, we're having to react to the, business, the, yeah. the demands so the of the demands. business. Yeah. And, and the business is turning around and saying, we, we need a solution quickly yeah. that, that we need to deliver out. And, and, and it seems to tick all the boxes while we were mm-hmm. investigating how we can we do this. It, is Yeah, this was yeah. It's definitely the quickest so it's, way. It's, the functionality has been an immediate win. Yes. What about the wider impact of getting this all up and running in the business? How's that? Is the, you, are we looking at you know, you changing the way that you're spending your budgets? There, there is a change to, to the budgetary um, figures that we've got on this. When we investigated replicating what Exchange um, Office 365 can deliver in failover um, and availability, uh, we did a costing exercise comparing that to on-premise, and, and there was a notable cost saving for, for us as a business yeah. to actually do this through a hosted service. And <clears throat> it's moved it from the capital expenditure budget, which it would have been an upfront cost to the business, yeah. Now it's just an operational cost, so it's on a month-by-month month service. So, so yes, that, that is a different way of spending the money. Yeah. And you're looking at, um, you were saying, the, the um, last winter, with such a large mobile workforce, the kind, of, the kind of issues that you guys would have had with the snowfall and nobody being able to get anywhere. Yeah, and... it, it, it's, uh, again, another positive that we've got. It's, it's, we have our sales force out on the road. We have our engineers out on the road. Um, they invariably would still stay in communication with the office. But what we can see is one of the benefits from going for Office 365 is if the snow falls like it did last winter, it's our office-based workers who only have a desktop in the office, which is what they work from, all of a sudden we can actually deliver them a solution for them to work from home when they're not able to make it actually into the office and stay in communication with the rest of our customer base as well. So, so yeah, it it might be a little bit of of a a side issue that we fell upon at the end, but, but when you start to try and work out the benefits of, of going in this direction, then, yeah, that was, that was another big plus for us as well. So this is actually, there's some important points here from what we've just been discussing. One of them is um, you hear a lot of people talk about the move to the cloud as if, you know, the whole thing depends on taking something that you're doing in-house already and then you're shifting it into the cloud. Usually the argument is to save money. And, yeah, you know, that was... Yep. Nothing wrong with, with, with that. There's nothing but wrong actually, with actually, what, what we find in the research and what a lot of reg readers tell us, actually, is um, that a lot of the first move into these kind of hosted applications, these kind of cloud solutions, uh, is because it allows them to deliver something which they can't actually do at the moment a bit more quickly yeah. and a bit more um, cost-effectively. So they can accelerate the time to solving a, you know, some sort of problem that the business guys are banging on the door about. And that's kind of what, what I was hearing from, from yeah. what you, you, you were saying there. Yeah. So I think that's really important. I mean, the other thing as well, you started alluding to you know, the fact that some, some aspects of, of the hosted solution um, take a lot of headaches out of things for, for you from an IT point yeah, of view. Yeah, well, again, going back to the point uh, I made earlier, <clears throat> email volume has grown substantially over the last five yeah. years with inside our organisation, probably with inside the last two years. It, it's... it's probably 66% growth on year on year on. Um, it's making, for, for us, it's making backups extremely difficult to schedule. Yeah. We've now got a database that's over uh, just approaching the terabyte. It, it's, it's a lot of data to it's try and data. S- to get backed up somewhere else and, and not affect the service you're actually yeah. providing to, to your user base as well. So Running out of corners to hide yes. it in. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, the carpet is now stuffed and, 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 and we have a lot of bumps in it. So, so yeah, from, from just from a business continuity point of view, from that aspect as well, then, then that's another key issue and a yeah. key deciding factor for us as well is it's off of our backup schedule. It lessens the task of us being able to check that the backups are worked overnight, schedule it, the downtime that we need on, on exchange or even doing it... Um, while it's running live and slowing the system down as well. So, yeah, our day-to-day environment should be a little bit more organised and it should free up the service desk guys to be able to deal with day-to-day problems. So we're we're hoping that this is the first part, first step in reducing the the volume of calls and the volume of issues that we get from from having the uh, the system on site, on premise. We've got a question, question in from Carl. He says, how do the SaaS applications work with your field engineers and sales staff 
who may not have internet access whilst mobile. Is that an issue for you, or are they all online? Um, the, the mobile application that the guys use um, is down to uh, the mobile phone network. Um, yeah. So they're running over the 2G network. It, it, it's, it's not dependent. Um, and they will use the, the uh, internet functionality when they've got coverage. So yeah. our business application doesn't run via the office solution. This is just an added bonus that we can deliver to them. So they can add yeah. uh, their own mailbox. We can send out company-wide communications to them um, and they've got a place to go rather than it being posted out, which it currently is at the moment. So they actually feel part of, integral to the, to the yeah. business rather than, yeah, we're here, but, but are we really sort of involved yeah. in, in the day-to-day -day business processes as well? And again, there's a, there's a really important point to stress here, particularly with mobile workers in, in the field, and obviously that, that was in the mind of the, the person who sent the question in. Um, and, and, and that's that there, there are certain applications where you can deploy them in a uh, sort of centralised manner, so they're accessed through a browser or, or um, you know, they need to be connected uh, to actually use them um, that are nice to have. So you can actually in, in, enhance um, the the life of that individual, you can give them facilities that they wouldn't otherwise have at all. You know, and there might be occasions when they can um, access them. That's not a problem, provided it's not essential. And there are a lot of applications that actually fall into that really, really useful, but not actually time critical. So let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater when it comes yeah. to those kind of things. If you do have generally critical applications, um, there is a very, very important principle, which is they have to be tolerant of the occasional network outage. And um, or you know just the network not being yeah. available, even if you just wander out of coverage for a few minutes. If you're relying on that application, then you know you you, you need to have your application architecture being able to take care of that. And I think that's where um, you know you see two camps out there. You see some camps of vendors and service providers arguing that cloud is all about pure browser-based applications, and then you see others, arguably more realistic, hmm. that say. Um, cloud isn't necessarily about everything running on the server. It's okay to have a kind of, you know, client-server type of approach, yeah. uh, a more distributed sort you mean of processing you, model. You don't have to be a purist. Exactly. Yeah, there yeah. we go. And in fact, you can be if you want, if you've got essential apps that you're deploying to the field. You can't be a purist. It's, yeah. 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 There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. So if we just have a quick look here, we've got uh, this next slide that looks a little bit like a blue sunshine. <laughs> just nice and cheerful. Yeah. Nice your, and cheerful your, your slide. colleague Tim Phillips calls this a hedgehog slide. The hedgehog slide, <laughs> excellent. Yeah. So hi, Tim. It's a very right aggressive, a very <laughs> aggressive slide. This one, don't touch prickly. And yeah. So um, this, this one, this one is for you guys. This is what you. What's worrying you? What are the issues that are keeping the reg readers awake? What kind of what kind of stuff do we need to think about when well, we're looking at this kind of work? Yeah, this has really put this SaaS conversation into context because um, you know it's not. SaaS is a means to an end. It's not an end. It's not something you should strive mm. to do. It just happens that sometimes it makes sense when you put it in the context of certain things that are going on. So I mean, this, this is just things, you know, we run loads of research, as, as, as you know, um, two or three surveys a month, uh, quite often with the reg readers, across all sorts of subjects. And these are the kind of themes that come out quite a bit. There's um, a lot going on on the business side of things, new working practices, you know, restructuring. Um, sometimes business users are getting a little bit more tech savvy and that creates certain sort of issues or expectations around connecting yep. into stuff. Um, at the same time, um, you know, everyone is saying there's a lot more activity, whether it's more data, whether it's more transactions, you know, as things become more automated, everything becomes more connected. IT systems in general are just seeing a lot more throughput and a lot yeah. more volume of, of data. You know, that's not going to be any surprise to anyone. Uh, what else have we got here? Oh yeah, well the other thing is, well, you, you alluded to some of your desktop. Yeah. <coughs> I think you, the word is creaking. Creaking, yeah. Yes. Yes. So I mean, I'm, I'm generalising there, but you know, <laughs> it ranges from you know about to fall to pieces or already starting to fall to pieces to mm, we know it's uh, getting, uh, you know, it's, it's not long for this world. It's only yeah. going to be a matter of time yeah. before it starts to cost us loads of money. But anyway, there's, there's lots of people out there with, with older infrastructure, particularly after the last few years when people have deferred mm. because of the, the, the economic climate, they've deferred upgrades yeah. and modernization yeah. activity. And uh, IT is already stretched. I mean, if, if anyone out there is sitting there um, you know, with their feet up, then that, that, that's unusual, let's say. Uh, so all, and all that other stuff kind of puts more pressure on IT. So um, picking up on one of the things we were talking about earlier, I mean, the title of this thing is SaaS and productivity. Yeah. Um, I think thinking about productivity 
in the IT department is a really important part of yep. what SaaS can do. So, so that's what I was talking about there. And what's our last one? Well, yeah, the last, last point is makes new yeah. options actually quite interesting in that yeah. kind of context. So that's kind of, that gives us the background. We've got, the options are looking good. You know you need to do something. You've got pressing business reasons, pressing reasons within the IT department to go for this SaaS option. So do you want to talk us through, once you had made the decision, what, what, was, the, what was the next thing to do? This is, do you jump straight in with both feet this, and go, right, we're in the cloud? Th- this, is, this is where we're, we're at today. Is we, we've identified that this is definitely the best route that we need to go, mm-hmm. but you have to get your building blocks in place, first of all. You, you cannot, um, we, we found uh, with talking to our consultants, you, you cannot just turn around and say, today we are going to the cloud. Uh, it's not that we, easy. It's not that easy. There are a number of steps that you need to do before you, you should um, embark on a project like this. Um, we know that our Active Directory needs to be upgraded. We know that we have to standardise on our office applications. We've had to look at the desktop environment that we've got to make sure that that is capable of, of taking some of the applications that you can get uh, from the system. Part of the project that we're doing is, is we're looking to standardise Office 2010. Yeah. But we also know we've probably got equipment around that isn't capable of running Office 2010. So they have to be identified and, and, and cleaned. Uh, Active Directory uh, computer list needs to be cleaned up. So there's a tidy up exercise, yeah. and, and, and that's what we're going through at the moment. So we know we're on a good, solid platform before we then start making that leap into, yeah. into the cloud environment as a, as a whole. So. And you've got share, SharePoint's up and Sh- running SharePoint's already. up and running. That's, that's, that's been no issue for us whatsoever at all. Um, it's almost independent to, to uh, Active Directory at the moment, uh, the way that it's been rolled out. But now we're starting to get the building blocks in place, so it's an integral part of our business yeah. rather than it being just a, a, a yeah, software as service external to, to our core business. So you, you guys, you're piloting 365 We are piloting right 365, yeah. 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 How's that going? Very well. Yeah, yeah very well, yes. Um, our online Outlook account is, is duplicated from our Exchange account, um, and their yeah, functionality seems to be just as good as it is from, yeah. from in-house. So, yeah. so how, how long are you going to run the pilot for before you... When are you planning we to...? We hope to get the building blocks finished probably within about the next six weeks, mm-hmm. um, and then from there it's just a matter of, of getting the right equipment in place so that we can start doing yeah. the, the replication services up to the cloud. There, there's some bits and pieces that we know that we need to get in place yeah. first of all so yeah so if you had to pass a top tip like you know your best one thing that you found out from doing this onto the guys out there if they're thinking about doing this what do they need to know what are the things they need to know that you need to know what benefits you're going to gain from it in the first place you need yeah. to have a clear image of, of where you're taking uh, your IT services uh, you must have a driving factor to do it. It's not the sort of thing that you really should think about sitting it's there. It's not for going, fun. It's not something that you do. <laughs> no, no, not at all. So, no. and, and just make sure that you go through and check every single element that you need to have in place to make sure that, that if you are going this route, that it becomes a successful project. Yeah. Um, because of, uh, there are stories out there of it not always being quite as successful as it needs to be. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, key, the key aspect, the key lesson for everyone is know where you're going know what you want it to do, have a reason to do it, and then prepare properly. Yes. Yeah. Get your Boy Scout hats on. <laughs> Preparation. Yeah. Can I actually say, though, I mean, there's, there's, there's one step prior to that, which, um, and you guys know out there, a lot of people don't actually have a good handle on their current environment and what's actually in it. What makes it up? Yeah. I don't know what, what situation you, you don't have to comment on this, <laughs> but we know that you know a lot of people out there tell us in. Uh, uh, in research that, that we do with the readers, that you know, asset management isn't always as good as it should be. They don't necessarily know exactly how many PCs, what's installed on them, what the mix yeah. of. You know, so I think there's, Only there's an made worse, of, surely, by everybody bringing their own kit. Exactly, in. Yeah. And, and there are always those exceptions that are kind of out, out, off the radar. So I think uh, a, you know, a, a genuine appraisal, a proper appraisal of an honest appraisal of where you are is, is yeah. a good starting point. Yeah. And then you can go through the preparation. Yeah. How do you get from A to B then? Is you need to know where A is before yes, you can yeah, start yeah, planning yeah, your right, route. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. Now, Dale, so far we've really been talking to you as an analyst, but if you could, for a moment, step outside your analytical role. You're also a man who uses this technology. You use this technology in your, in your business world. SaaS isn't a new thing for you. What, what are the, the things, some pointers that you might be able to, to give, things that you've learned or yeah, people so might need to beware of? 
Yeah, so, so I mean, just, just to sort of elaborate on what you've just said, we're, we're um, most of the time I'm sitting in this seat as an analyst mm -hmm. talking about what the readers are telling us, but we as a business have been using um, SaaS, in fact, running our whole business on SaaS so ever since it started. And in the, the previous business I was involved in, we, um, we introduced SaaS. So I've been, I've been sort of involved in this stuff for about eight or nine years, one way or, or another. So putting my sort of somebody who runs a small business hat on, uh, there's some interesting things that we've discovered over the years. You, you, you've got to be very careful about um, understanding what your service provider is going to yeah. provide for you. Uh, you know, we've had some that have, uh, you know, surprised us with what they don't do: basic backup and recovery type of um, activity. And you know, the important point there is you, you, you've got to understand what the provider is is, is providing because they all vary massively. You, you know, yeah. Even if this they're delivering is, exchange, it's, this yeah. is actually very relevant to a question that's just mm. come in uh, from Jonas. I think it says, "What? How do you feel about the cloud aspect of all of this? Is it making you nervous? What steps have you taken to protect yourself from failures or data storage issues? Those kind of issues. What have you done to protect yourself from just the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, the providers exactly. not." Yeah necessarily providing everything you're looking for? What, what kind of backups? I mean, let, you give, give me, let me give you sort of three flavours of, of, of service providers that we've come across. I mean, one of them is the big mega hosters like um, Microsoft, uh, who clearly have huge data centres and, you know, you might ask questions about location of data yep. and uh, those kind of things. Um, you've then got... Uh, um, people at the other end of the spectrum who are maybe, you know, small service providers uh, small solution companies mm. who, who were kind of installing SharePoint or whatever for a living, and then they decided that wouldn't it be nice if we we, offer our, we would offer our customers a software as a service um, uh, solution. And when you scratch behind the surface, some of those they're, they're really run on a shoestring, and yeah. uh, so you've got to be really really careful when you're dealing with those guys. It can look quite attractive, um, and then you've got sort of more established local players um, where. Yeah, um, they're, they're kind of national players who have a, a good local setup. They can answer a lot of your concerns that you might have about mm -hmm. mega hosters. And there's no right or wrong in any of these, but you really do need to understand what they are providing, what they're yeah. doing with your data, where they're storing it, how they're managing it. If you do have a problem, can they? Re what, what are the recovery options, yeah. etc. I'm going to just take us back a take us back a slide briefly, actually, if you don't mind, because mm. there's a couple of questions come in. Sorry, didn't mm. see them soon enough. Um, Somebody who's called himself Good Point Dale says, "What did Jeff do in terms of asset appraisal? What tools did you use to, to um, get there, yourself?" There that? are tools that are provided with Office 365, which allows you to go and analyse your your domain mm -hmm. um, and do collection against that. It also looks at everything that's turned on with an IP address, and it produces reports. And against these reports, you can see what equipment is at the right level what equipment yeah. needs to be upgraded, and even down to whether the, the actual hard, physical hardware needs to be replaced or whether it's something as simple as a memory upgrade is enough to be able to get yeah. that compliant with, with where we're trying to go. So there are tools out there that Microsoft yeah. provide that, that allows you to do this. So it's not, it's not, you're not working from scratch, no, you're working no. blind. You don't have to go around counting no, your computers. It's, 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 That's, good it's simple, yeah. That's good to know. That's good to know. That's good to know. And then uh, Martin would like to know a little bit more about the selection of 365. Why specifically 365? What else did you look at? Did you look at anything else? Or we you we already... only really, we, again, uh, going back to the point we, we made at, at the start, um, it was a recommendation that came in from Form IT Solutions mm. when we started to talk, um, uh, talk to them about what direction we needed to go to, to resolve the problem we got in their exchange environment. And, and realistically, it's based upon their recommendation and their close ties to Microsoft as well. Yeah. Their experience with, with this type of delivery um, is, is, is the recommending factor that, yeah. you know, our overruling factor that we had. So in, it's, almost, it's almost a natural progression, a kind of an upgrade path almost, yeah, rather it, than it, anything Again, else. because of the elements that come with it, we know that we need to standardise an Office uh, 2010 yeah. um, and, the and, and the structure of the licensing, it, it, does lend itself to, to the yeah. Microsoft 365 solution, so, so it, it ticked a lot of boxes that we were looking for at the time. I mean, can I comment from our point of view? Because yeah. we use hosted Exchange, we use hosted SharePoint, we use um, uh, hosted CRM, but it, it, it's, it's spread around at the moment. We use hosted um, web conferencing as well from another uh, provider. Um, when I look at Office 365, and you know, we're not we're not users uh, right now, but we have been looking at it. The attraction is uh, you can start 
in any of the particular application areas, but, <coughs> but then you can kind of expand it um, in a coherent way. And I think when I look at Office 365, that's probably the biggest um, uh, benefit for, for anyone who's yeah. kind of dabbled with SaaS before and yeah. had to sort of... Because, you know, pe people forget the fact that if you've got multiple service providers, and we've been down this route a couple of times in the past, you've got to get all these services working together, as well as with your yeah. in-house systems. Um, so, you know, what, what Microsoft's done with Office 365, it actually is going to help quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, there, there's a point that, that I probably should have mentioned earlier as well, is, is with inside the distribution of the IT team now throughout the area that we're in, we're, we're using the link element um, of Office 365 to communicate between IT staff so that we're actually sharing problems around the group of mm. IT knowledge base that we've got. So if somebody's already experienced a problem with inside the area, then the solution could come from somebody with inside that group. Again, it's another great tool that, yeah. that previously wasn't available to us. So, so with, this, with this change from being the, the isolated, well, isolated, but semi-autonomous yes. UK and Ireland arm to this, you know, this pan-European approach that's been taken now, are you... Um, want, uh, Carl, Carl writes in, would, have you had to upgrade your network access? To cope with the change in the services, I mean, have you have you changed the way no, that you're at the moment? Um, we, we're starting to pull the network together. So mm. the, again, this is part of the building blocks that we need to do. Not only yeah. do we need to do this for the UK, but then we're going to have to start moving into our European teams yeah. and the European offices and start to pull their network apart and, and go through the same exercise. So our rollout plan is to do it country by country, yeah. directly to the internet, bring them on one at a time, rather than doing big bang and affecting 26 countries all at the same time. Yeah. So. Yeah, so when we said knee deep in a migration, we maybe should have said neck deep in the migration. <laughs> Can uh, I just chip in on that one? Yeah, because absolutely. we've done some research with the readers around this recently, this connectivity thing. And um, it's interesting because we, we've heard a few people kind of assume that because they've already been through setting their, their network up and their infrastructure for remote access, i.e. guys in the field coming <laughs> in, that that prepares them for cloud because obviously yeah. they've got sort of yeah. you know, communication internal, external going on. But actually, when you turn it on its head and you've got a whole bunch of guys internally relying on one remote service, that actually changes the whole dynamics of the thing and it puts a different kind of stress on your network. So um, you, when you get into cloud, particularly if you've got lots of office-based workers mm. and, and you're using remote apps, you've got to really make sure you understand yes. that. So it's, uh, it's worth stressing, I think. Yeah. Okay, we've got a couple, a couple of extra questions here. We're rolling in. You guys are on fire. Um, was this a constant hand-holding project, asks Adrian, i.e., did, did the consultants do the dirty work or did you do it in-house? And what would, you be, what would be your recommendation? Is it a, is it a job for an in-house team? Uh, the, the SharePoint element is a job for an in-house team. Okay. Um, that, that's relatively simple to get up and running. Um, create the user, start creating the sites, away you go. Really, really, yeah. very, very simple rollout. The exchange, um, we're going to engage with our partners for the first country being the UK um, and make sure that we know exactly what we're doing and how to make the transition between the two different sites. And then as we go around the rest of Europe, we're, our reliance upon the consultants will become less and less. So we're going to go lessons learned off for the first time, yeah. slowly reduce their involvement as we, as we roll around as the rest of Europe. Build yeah. your as, own as, experience, exactly. yeah. as our knowledge increases, yeah. um, the, the reliance on, on the uh, consultants will be less. So by the time you get to country 13, you'll probably we, we should be, be doing, doing, it, on your, doing yeah. it on your own. I think the principle there is no different to any big migration. Though. Mm. If, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you know, you're only going to do once, yeah. and yeah. You, know, you don't want to skill up in-house to do that. You, you, you get someone else to, yeah. to come and help you. And then we have another one about what's the ROI on this? It must have cost some money. Do you know what the ROI is, says Jason Anderson? The Do ROI. You know yet? That, or should we come back to you in six months? Probably come back to you in six months. Yeah. Initial investigation is, is we think there's about a £20,000 saving on doing a comparative rollout just on the exchange requirement. Yeah. So to have. The, Which is not uh, to be sniffed at. No, no. Let's face it, yeah. To have the failover facility, the, the, the system availability that, that comes with Microsoft, to be able to replicate that in house, yeah. we think we've, we've identified a cost of, of about £20,000 saving. Yeah. And then we have one more question here, which is uh, how long did the prep work take? Prep work is still going on. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, prep it's, it's a long time, a long time. Yeah. And, uh, so that's the so, question of yeah. scale and where you're starting from. Yeah. I mean, we had um, Royal Mail in here uh, a few months ago talking about their big BPOS migration, and that was quite interesting. 
Uh, they, and that was a months, months and months yeah. job, just doing the prep before they even started the migration. Yeah. And then this is this is probably this next question I'm going to take. This is we're going to I'm going to lead back into you with this one, Dale. But um, because it kind of plays to what you were talking about about knowing your providers and what they're capable of doing. Do you have an exit strategy? Uh, if you want to change to a different provider, how are you going to manage that? Plan for the exit before you get in. <laughs> it's not a very optimistic approach, but probably quite quite sensible. Yeah, it, it, this, is, this is part of the exchange um, planning that's going on at the moment is, is if it doesn't work for us, where do we go next? Yeah. Um, and that will be before we make the leap in, we will know where we can come yeah. back out again. So, yeah, yeah that, that is all part of our process. Because you, Dale, you've done this, haven't you? you you've swapped providers, switched, swapped? switched yeah. providers. We, we, we have, and, and um, it's something that we, we, we have quite a few debates uh, about with um, you know, more sort of purist types that we, we mentioned earlier on. Because there's an argument that says you know, applications should be designed specifically for the cloud and uh, you know, that if they were conceived in that way, then they're going to be infinitely better than something which actually can run on-premise and, and run in the cloud. And, and actually, we look at it in a, quite a different way. If you, if you go with a service which is back-ended by something which is either based on something that you could run on-site or it's very, very close to and compatible with something you can run on-site, then you've got options. So if that <coughs> service provider goes um, uh, belly up or, you know, as in a case that, that we had, they, they just weren't um, keeping up to date with releases. So we were getting, you know, we were two releases behind with one service provider. Which we, is nearly prehistoric. We, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, there was functionality we really, really needed yeah. and we just couldn't get access to. So, you know, we were able to, because it was based on a standard solution, just pick it up and migrate to, in this case, another service provider. In theory, you could bring it in-house. Mm. But I think um, that, that's quite important, actually. Uh, so services based... We're kind of on balance in, in favour of services based on um, portable back-end software. Yeah. Um, kind of, again, relevant question for you, Dale. What advice can you give on integration between multiple SaaS providers? If you, I mean, you guys are going Microsoft, yeah. but you've, done, you, you've got different people running different bits. How do you, how do you handle the administrative side of that when, you, when it, you've got it, all of that? It's hard. Company? I mean, we're quite yeah. a small company, and, and um, you know, with four providers... Um, that, that form the core of what we use. It's uh, that's a challenge. I mean, what we're missing is the ability to run an Active Directory across multiple yeah. providers, and I think that's a big hole in the industry at the moment, uh, particularly for smaller businesses like us. Um, but but I think if if you've got, got a larger environment, um, then making sure that you can sync your your Active Directory properly uh, and manage policy synchronization across different yeah. providers is really important. To the degree where I would say you should make that a pretty important selection criteria before you actually enter into a contract. You know, understand what you can and can't do. That's not to say, you know, because it's still pretty immature out there and yeah. in most cases. Um, it, so it's not going to be perfect. No, there's going to be stuff that the providers exactly, don't but, know you need. Yet. Exactly, yeah. but at least make sure you understand what, what, what the situation yeah. is and then you can plan for it. Make, make sure you've got the right expertise yeah. in-house and systems in place. Sorry there's not an easy answer to that. Yeah. There's no easy answers. Okay. And then um, one quick question. John would like to know, when do you actually go live with your 365? Because you're in the prep stage now. You're doing We're still in the prep stage. Uh, we've got no definitive go live date. Yeah. So I would say probably... Wait till you're safe. Early next year. Yeah. And, and, until the prep works out the way, I don't think yeah. we can commit. So um, I would think it's going to be early next year. Yeah. Uh, what steps are you taking to ensure smooth user adoption of the new applications? Colin says. He says, this is not really a cloud question or an age-old problem of trying to teach old dogs new tricks. <laughs> because the solution is is relatively similar to their desktop experience that they've got now, they will still have Outlook. They, the, the technology that we're due to change isn't about the desktop or the user experience. This is about in the IT um, support and provision yeah. of service area. So we don't plan to move that many people away from the, the normal standard office experience yeah. that they've got today. So, so as far You're as they're concerned, the stuff that it, it works. Is, yeah, in the yeah, this is yeah. what they're familiar with. It, there's not a big change for, for our user base at all. So, can I send a little message to Microsoft here? Yeah. Because um, yeah, Microsoft. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> we uh, we migrated from Office 2003 to 2007 a few years ago now, and at that time, I remember um, that migration. There were loads of tools that were available, things like, you know, this is how it used to work in Office 2003, yeah. here's how to get to the same thing in 2007. 
I think there's kind of been an assumption that everyone's moved to 2007 and we're 2010 now. Now, we, we recently recruited someone who came from a firm that was using 2003. And yeah. uh, I said, oh, there's a load of tools that you know, help you understand the new menu structure and ribbon. And all. Could I find them? No. <laughs> and I, think I, think kind of, I don't know. I, these things have just kind of slipped away. But there are so many people yeah. moving from 2003 to 2010. Just skipping the, 20, yeah. the, the, the skipping 2007. 2007. I think, yeah. you know, a lot of that stuff that was done back then when 2007 was first launched is still very relevant. The hand-holding is necessary. Yeah, so, so it's so. worth having all that stuff documented. Yeah. It does exist. It's just yeah. not as I've got obvious. 2003 on my machine at home. <laughs> shh, don't tell. It's fine. So, yeah, so if we go back to... Go back to your um, your own experiences, and because I mean, you guys, you guys, you're kind of right in the middle of this. You're going through, but <coughs> Dale's an old hand. Yeah. So what else have we got here? Um, oh, what's the nature and quality of support? So again, yeah. f for us as a small business, the last thing we wanted was someone out in the field running into a problem, and you know, we don't really have a an internal help desk, so we we wanted um, the ability for non technical users to be able to call in to the service provider. Now, for most people listening to this, that probably isn't a big deal. But even if you're routing stuff through your own um, help desk, you, you need to make sure what the service provider is yeah. and isn't going to yeah. support you with on that. So just understanding what's the nature of support and kind of quality of support, because it varies a lot. It really does. That would presumably, the, the, the way that support is handled presumably would be quite a significant issue for you guys, because you've got your mobile workforce who are, they don't care how their PDAs tell them what they need to know. But if their PDA isn't telling them what they need to know, they just want it to work. They just you know, want it to work. Man in a van, box of tools, on his way to fix a door. Yeah. Doesn't care about your contract structure and so forth. But at the same time, do you want him, you need to know that he can call the people he needs to call to get up and running, or do you run it all through yourselves? Um, he will call into the service yeah. desk. We need to be aware of any issues that we've got yeah. with users that are out, a, out in the field or, or B, office space. It may well be that we've got a problem with the delivery of, of, of the um, software. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we will be involved with inside any... Yeah. any, any yeah. And it might well be, you know, a very simple low-level call that, that, you know, that the help desk can answer straight away on the yeah. phone and, and the user can carry on with the business rather than so they, it, they it being escalated. Yeah, yeah. 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 How, how about your um, your update policies and things like that? How are we how, how are we looking at those? Do you do you? Some people would want it to be as up to date as possible. Oh, all certainly, the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other people, yes, like you were well, saying, again, you, it, you, it, were two, you were two versions behind. But, massively, yeah. But what if it's working for you? You were saying, you know, it's like we're not really going to change the way that the users are running things. Well, being an desk. industry analyst firm, we we like to be on the leading bleeding edge. It doesn't really worry <laughs> us that much, but. Through our research, we come across lots of organisations that actually don't like and, and they've run into problems because their service provider is constantly pushing updates yeah. at them. And if they've got quite rigorous change control mechanisms in place, particularly if they've got compliance-related requirements, that can actually be a challenge. So yeah. you know, it's important to get a, uh, a match between the philosophy, the rollout yeah. philosophy and upgrade philosophy of your service provider and what's comfortable for you. And you know, there's no right or wrong in that. It just needs to match. So it's worth checking, because they are all different. Again, I mean, it, yeah. I'm sounding boring now, but <laughs> do not assume anything when you're shopping around for SaaS yeah. services. Really, assumption don't. is is yeah. the mother of all <coughs> of those things. Uh, okay, I think we've got time for, I think we've got time for another question quickly. So um, I have here a question from Richard. Uh, Jeff, now that you have taken on the management of all the other countries' IT operations support, is that quite right? No, that, that, that's no, not, no. no. It, it, that's at not the moment, done, we are a team across yeah, Europe that is being Europe. pulled together as yeah. one team. So. But he was interested in looking at um, centralising backup policies and back office system data and, and locally stored data. Is that, so is that, that's not come up as an issue because it's still distributed? It's still distributed yeah. at the moment. So uh, most, most of the um, other countries are run their systems out of a uh, parent company in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, so they've got network links back into Germany, and Germany are taking responsibility for, company yeah. for their backup of, of their ERP systems. So, but again, that will be after the exchange project is finished, then there will be a restructuring with inside the way that we host other applications as well. And, and, and yeah, that's to be determined yet. OK. I think we've probably covered the bulk of the important stuff there. So. Let's see, we've got some further reading 
for you guys out there. If you want to uh, click the download button floating above our heads at the moment, then you will be able to get hold of a copy of the presentation so you can, at your leisure, click through. Um, and uh, really, then, all that is left to say is thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, thank you Dale, for coming You're in and talking music. about the, the pain and sweetness of migrations <laughs> <laughs> and SAS. So uh, thanks very much for your time, guys. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, good luck.